Hi, it's Andy Hoffman again, Media Director for Miles Franklin Precious Metals. Today I'm privileged to have Chris Duane as my guest. A former Marine, Chris left his family business in 2008 to empower people to stand up for themselves, not just financially but in all aspects of life. His Sons of Liberty Academy is the focal point of such education, supplemented by his Silver Bullet, Silver Shield newsletter. Chris is a diehard believer in real money and personal protection and can be followed on his website, DontTreadOnMe.com. I was lucky enough to meet him at this year's Liberty Mastermind Symposium, and I'm honored to have him on the Miles Franklin audio blog. Chris, how are you doing? Excellent. I'm very excited to be here uh, with you today. It's, uh, it was really good to meet a whole bunch of people, especially you at the Liberty Mastermind Symposium, because I think a lot of us uh, tend to you know, run our own path and very rarely look over the guy next to us who's kind of running along right with us. And uh, it was really good to meet you in particular because I think we share uh, a lot of the same views and I kind of find myself the outcast in a lot of the precious metal and uh, a lot of the other things. And I seem to found a lot of synchronicity with your views. So it was good to be here. Yeah, uh, I would hardly characterize you as an outcast. It's, you know, the thing that's, that's most interesting to me is I've now been fully devoted to precious metals for almost 12 years. And I think of how the landscape has changed, just like, uh, you know, com new companies take over the industry. I think of all the new faces that have come in and made a real impact, and, and you're certainly one of them. Well, thank you. Okay, so let's, uh, as usual, start with uh, the week's top stories, and then we'll move on to some broader topics. Uh, we'll start, of course, with the reality of the global economy and the farce of the FOMC minutes. Uh, first, of course, Wednesday's uh, publication of the so-called minutes of the uh, October 30th FOMC meeting where of course they left their QE program in place and I say minutes facetiously as uh, honestly I don't I don't believe they actually reflect the meeting itself but instead the key buzzwords Wall Street wants to hear in this case uh, the minutes as usual depicted essentially zero incremental information and you know just a day before both Yellen and Bernanke essentially said we're going to keep QE going indefinitely uh, yet we're supposed to believe that if they simply say we might taper, if data supports it, it's somehow bad for gold, even after and so even after they've been slammed. Chris, what do you think the modus operandi of the FOMC minutes has become in recent years? Yeah, as usual, you can never listen to these guys, but watch what they do. Um, and all the releases, all the publications, the minutes, all that other stuff is just pure propaganda. It's it's really meant to. Uh, mind control everybody into thinking that maybe they'll stop printing the obscene amount of money of $85 billion a month. Um, you know, if anybody were to tell me five years ago that they'd be printing that kind of money, I would say, God, you know, <laughs> and the dollar still has value. Um, and, and this is just what they're telling us. So th it's a, a complete farce. Um, they cannot, will not ever shut down uh, monetary printing, um, even if they tell you uh, that they might do it officially or whatever, it, it can't. We have an unsustainable debt-based paradigm that must create more debt every year in excess of the debt and interest accrued the year before, um, or else the system collapses. And, and in 2008, we were within hours, hours of the entire world economy collapsing. Uh, you can listen to Representative Ken uh, Kenjowski. Uh, from Pennsylvania who testified to that. Uh, there's Fed minutes that talked about uh, the unprecedented actions that the Fed had to take. Um, and now, you know, five years later, we're far worse off with less safety nets. Uh, people don't have the home equity jobs um, and, and uh, you know, the safety nets. And, and we don't have the faith in our politicians or even our central bankers anymore. Uh, because I think in 2008, there was still that half the country hoping that Obama was going to come save the world. And I think that we're, you know, we're in a place now where it's going to be very dangerous the next time this, uh, an economic crisis hits. Yeah, that uh, $85 billion, which, I mean, it's pretty obvious that that's not the real number. We, you know, we're well aware of the $16 trillion of secret loans that the Fed gave out. Of course, mm -hmm. the Fed swap agreements that go over to Europe now, which don't count as money printing because they're swaps rather than loans. And, uh, and then, you know, the, the craziest thing about this tightrope of propaganda they walk is by trying to uh, suggest that they're going to slow down this astronomic number, all they do is put upward pressure on interest rates, uh, which, you know, th back when they did that in June, when they even hinted at it, they basically crushed the housing market. We're at, you know, plummeting refinancing activity, uh, consumer confidence, et cetera. I mean, 
What do you think? Is there any possible way that interest rates could go up without it causing a catastrophic collapse in economic activity? No. And, and Andy, the, the, this is the problem that I think that most people are completely blind to. Um, you know, if you look at the debt that was accumulated, I don't know, say 2000, um, there's like half as much debt out there as there is today. And, you know, I, I did a chart for my for my paid members showing the amount of just total U.S. admitted federal debt and then the and calculated the interest payments uh, on that debt, given the, you know, the, the nominal interest rate at the time. And um, you could see how the interest rates have come down over the past 30 years with this titanic bond bubble and the debts have gotten exponentially bigger. OK, but any move now and we're getting to the point now where any move up in interest rates, um, it'll get to the point where it because it, the debt is so large now that any nominal move, you know, it, teeny moves. I mean, two, three, four percent will have huge ramifications to the point where, um, you know, the entire income tax money couldn't even go to pay for the interest on the total amount of debt. And to, to, to get even further into this. This is just the debt that they're admitting to. This doesn't uh, include the, um, you know, the off-balance sheet, such as uh, like the wars and and the unfunded liabilities. The, 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 it is an absolute insane world that we live in, and yet we're all whistling along like nothing's going on. That's right. I mean, simple math: uh, 17 trillion of debt, one percent increase, and that's 170 billion of annual debt service costs. And of course, because the Fed was dumb enough. Uh, to you know, to go out on the yield curve, they've exposed themselves, their own portfolio, which is heavily leveraged, uh, to the decline in interest rates, um, uh, to the rise in interest rates, and uh, and of course they over the years, uh, up until very recently, they have focused on short term debt uh, because it has lower rates. But the problem is short term debt matures, and since rates are rapidly moving up, you're going to see in the next few years a lot of refinancing at higher rates. So. I mean, this is a trap where it's almost comical when, you know, the CNBCs and the Reuters talk about how good it might be if they could taper, when in fact, all that's going to do is drive interest rates higher and deficits. And, and the scary thing, Andy, is that's assuming that the economy still functions. I think that the, the next time around, uh, I think the panic in, the, in, the, in all paper assets, the bond market, the stock market, the currency market, the FX, like all these things, I mean... I don't see how we're even going to repeat 2008 and have, a, you know, a bad recession or a bad, uh, you know, greater depression. I mean, I, I don't see how the whole system holds together when it becomes just blatantly obvious that it's an unsustainable system. I mean, it need, it, these debts need to be, uh, I mean, they're generational and they need to be expunged. They need to be wiped away. They they need to, to be devalued and and. and and destroyed. And uh, I, I think the only way that that happens is a currency collapse. And, you know, I, you know, people you know, are laughing at me because I'm buying silver at $20 an ounce. Um, I don't see any other physical asset that's going to protect you inside uh, that kind of uh, the situation that I see coming. Well, you're right. All these things don't happen in a vacuum, which is one of the, you know, the, when people email me with questions like, what if they confiscate gold? It's the kind of question where people are acting as if it would just happen in a vacuum. If they were even talking about that stuff, things would fall apart, just like if, if we had another economic uh, crash. And now that the Fed has no more ammo since they use it all, of course, you can't say what would happen because there wouldn't be the ability to bail things out. And, um, you know, we talk about QE expanding. I mean, this is just this week's news stories. The, uh, you know, the Bank of Japan met again, and they are now talking about despite their plan that starts six months ago to double the money supply in two years, they're talking about potential nominal GDP targeting, which I wrote about the other day, and even targeting equities themselves. And this is in a supposedly recovering economy. And then, of course, last week you had the ECB lower rates to a quarter percent, which is essentially ZERP. And on top of that, throwing out their hints of maybe going negative interest rates, maybe actually instituting an overt uh, uh, QE policy as opposed to the covert one, which they currently have, in which the ECB uh, guarantees uh, loans that the, that the sovereign nations give to banks. So I think the QE thing is a Ponzi scheme that has to grow larger. And I'd ask you what you uh, see in this trend, but you just answered it for me. So we'll do the the one final uh, the one final topic about of the week, and that would be what we've seen in the economy this week. Now, again. 
we got people all excited that we're going to taper, et cetera, et cetera, even though the Fed said last week that they're not going to do it. But this has been the worst earnings season in two years. The worst in two years. We've had 2 to 3% S&P earnings growth year over year, but it's negative if you include the bank numbers, which are all fraudulent. Negative earnings growth. It's been the worst, uh, the worst quarter of negative earnings surprises in recorded history. And that goes back to, to 2008. Uh, you've seen companies like Caterpillar report negative revenue growth in all global regions for the first time in three years. And as far as the holiday spending season this year, uh, you know, one major analyst said uh, those that don't open on Thanksgiving will get slaughtered. We've seen Best Buy, Kohl's, Lowe's, Ross, Target, you name it. I mean, this is going to be one of the worst holiday seasons ever. I mean, Chris, what does the world economy look like? Are there any bright spots or is it simply like us conspiracy theorists are talking about? Well, I mean, how do you, how do you as a businessman plan when you have things like Obamacare, uh, you know, hanging over your head? How, you, how do you as an investor when you have central banks of the world uh, manipulating the markets on such a blatant and obvious level? Um, and, and, you know, they, the, they could pull the plug at any second and, and cause the markets to crash. Uh, they can hyperinflate these markets and, and cause them to skyrocket in, in, in nominal value. Um, it, it's and, and we're what four years into this recovery. The Dow's at sixteen thousand. Um, I mean, it, it, it's it's an insane world, and it's and this is the time where I get just. I know that when things are like this, the best thing to do is be quiet and be still and listen. And I'd rather be in the safest, you know, most, uh, you know, least counterparty risk assets, and that's why I'm into precious metals the way that I am. Um, and I'd rather miss out on all these bonanzas of stocks and, uh, you know, all these other, you know, the painting market, the art market's going all crazy, the Bitcoin market's going crazy, all these, you know, little markets all over the place are, are going crazy. Um, and I, I just know that the counterparty risk and, and the interconnection and the, uh, the magnitude of what is going on here is so large that it's, you know, it's, it's a very scary time to be investing or uh, doing anything and then you know geez on a business level how, how do you how do you deal with this you know you get the labor force participation rate at an at a all-time low um you know people are, are really getting hurt with all the debts that they have accrued and the economy hasn't improved over the last four years um and you know i i think we're also getting to the point now where like you know what else is there to go out and buy i i don't i don't i don't i don't see the you know the big things out there even for the christmas market for that people are just clamoring for no, we're talking about the low-end retailers that are talking about that, that they're having uh, difficult business. That's people who just can't afford to buy anything, let alone to buy, uh, you know, toys. And, yeah. uh, you know, you mentioned the safest. It's the time to be safe. Look, people in our world, um, we tend to be uh, cautious and actually use our common sense. This is not the first time. I mean, back in 2000, I sold, I had, I mean, I didn't have a lot of money back then, but I had tech stocks. They were my life. My, my, and I sold them all in early 2000 because I was scared and everyone hated me for it and they couldn't believe it. And I sat there quietly for two or three years because I just didn't want to lose money. And the same goes for now. Um, I mean, I, at one point I had a line of mining stocks, but starting a few years back, I don't even have them anymore. It's all yeah. precious metals because I know they're not going to go anywhere. As my friend said the other day, Bitcoin could go to a million or it could go to zero. Gold's not going anywhere. Yeah. And uh, I know that when, when this game is over, the purchasing power will be a lot higher, even if in this very minute of time, the, the bad guys seem to be in control of the game. Yeah. And, and Andy, it's the times that my investments are the least popular or the, the when I look back, those were the best moves. I mean, I literally have only done two major moves my entire life. I mean, I, I bought a house, um, but then I sold my house at the top of the housing bubble, July 2005, with a seven month pregnant wife. Uh, and I bought silver. And um, selling my house in the middle of the housing bubble, I was hated. I mean, I told my friends and family, and they, they were insane. You know, they said I was insane. I have a child on the way. How could I do that? Uh, you know, you're going to be priced out of the market. You'll never get into that. And, you know, three years later, I, I, I looked like an absolute genius. Um, and then for me to then put my money into silver, oh, God, what are you doing? And yet those are the two moves that have allowed me to uh, totally extricate myself from the uh, you know, from the current paradigm. I mean, just by the, just by doing those two things. And I would much rather be in the most hated, undervalued, 
beat down, uh, depressed markets such as what gold and silver are today. I mean, I, 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 I stutter at the fact that, uh, you know, we're back at the same prices pre Lehman. I mean, this is insane for precious metals, considering the trillions upon trillions of dollars that the federal government has taken, that the, 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 the uh, Federal Reserve has added onto their balance sheet, uh, the lo trillions of loans that are out there. The risk is magnitudes more than where we were before Lehman, and yet silver's at twenty dollars today. I mean, it is insane to me. But I know that these are the times that I'm I'm most aggressive uh, in in uh, in getting these things because in the long run, and I'm sure a few years from now, I'm going to look back at this moment when everybody hated silver and you know everybody's jumping on the Bitcoin and and you know all these other stocks and bonds and. They'll allow you to make money in their fiat world, but it's they're going to try very hard to squeeze you out of the real solutions that are out there. And I think, uh, you know, real tangible assets are, are the way to go. Except, of course, this time around, as opposed to, you know, pre Lehman, the cost of reduction of silver is, you know, in the 20s, uh, if not yeah. close to the 30s for the small producers. And of course, the inventories worldwide of, of, uh, of the precious metals are being drained at a record pace. So we're yeah, talking and, and about... Andy, yeah. look at the sales. Yeah. I mean, the United States minted, what, 40 million ounces of silver? I, I don't even know what the, the... If they did 4 million in 2005, I would be amazed. I mean, we're talking magnitudes more demand. You look at what India's doing, you look at what the Silver Eagle sales are doing, magnitudes more in that time period, um, and, and yet we're at a lower price. It, it's it, it, These are the times where if it doesn't make sense, you got to really think hard and get your and get your mindset because this is the time where you make the most amount of money when people aren't listening and aren't putting a lot of thought into it and, and emotionally going after the hot thing instead of logically thinking about um, you know the the real the reality of the situation. Well, we have you know two worlds when you talk about silver because again I work for one of the largest bullion dealers and you know this year has been a down year uh, probably more for for many other deals but generally speaking. There's been very little interest in the United States, and yet this, the U.S. Mint is, has already, in the first nine months of the year, sold more than in 2011, when first silver went to $50, and then we had this whole currency crash where gold went to almost 2000 And so I'm telling you, I'm telling the world, it's the Chinese that are buying those silver eagles, so take note. And uh, you, know, you mentioned uh, you know, the, 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 big, uh, the two big things you did, which saved you, and uh, you know, for me, I was living in New York until 2007. I got married in 2002, and uh, my wife had a good job in New York. I had a good job, and she wanted a nest. Mm -hmm. And I said, I want to move to Colorado in the worst way, and I also am terrified of this housing market here. I won't buy. And it yeah. nearly cost me my marriage. And everyone said, are you crazy? How can you not buy a house? The interest rates uh, are low. You can write off your mortgage uh, interest, et cetera, and your real estate taxes, and I wouldn't do it. And yeah. finally, I came out here where prices were cheaper and I intended to stay, and it totally changed my life. So it's another example of not doing what people tell you, and it works out for you. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I moved, uh, you know, I had, that was the other uh, big move that I did uh, in 2008. Um, you know, I was in the retail car business, and my family had seven car dealerships. I mean, we were living high, high, high in the hog. Um, you know, for the past 20 years, I mean, the tri-state area, it was booming. I mean, people were buying... Uh, you know, all these cars, they were creating all this debt. And, um, you know, from 2005, when I sold my house to 2008, I was begging my parents and partners to sell their property and their, uh, you know, their stuff. And they just wouldn't listen to me because they were so, you know, their egos were invested in who they had become because of what they had owned. And I, and I kept telling them, you know, you can go buy something else. You could do something else. You'll be able to buy it back, you know, 10 cents on the dollar in, in that time period. Um, and after three years of me pounding the you know payment, trying to get other people to do what I had done, um, I said, well, if you're not going, I'm going. And I did the same thing. I mean, Andy, living in the tri-state area with, you know, these aggressive, uh, you know, narcissistic, under pressure people, um, and then moving out to, oh, geez, just about anywhere else in the country, you're, you're better off. I, I chose Ohio. Um, and, you know, I could buy four times the house at you know, half the price and, and property taxes are, you know, a quarter of what they were in New Jersey. And uh, again, I got that, you know, you know, are you insane for leaving? You know, people try so hard to get into New York and New Jersey and you're leaving. Um, <laughs> well, so those are the things that yeah. you really need to, to, to look for in life. Those big decisions where, yeah. you know, in your gut, logically it makes sense and, and it's not popular. Inevitably, those are the biggest ones that it, that'll extract you from 
the fate of the masses. And I, I'm telling everybody out there, when this next one comes, it's going to be huge. It's not going to be like, uh, you know, the, I missed out on the housing bubble. It's going to be the difference between, you know, generational poverty or generational wealth. I mean, the, the divide I, th I see coming um, in, in people's wealth and, and, uh, and, their, and their, where they are is, is going to be huge. And I think it's a bifurcation in history where I think so many people are unfortunately going to get left behind because they uh, feel compelled to follow what the crowd is doing. Yeah, and uh, it's certainly there's a, a grass is greener on the other side. You know, people think, well, you want to be in New York. I want to be in New York. But the point is people, uh, people in, uh, in the, on the coast are leaving for the middle of the country because it's a, a better standard of living. And, and for anyone that can do it, I suggest they look into it because the lower property taxes, the nicer houses, the, uh, the less crowds, it's not for everyone, but it certainly mm -hmm. makes life easier. Now you mentioned the uh, the surge in uh, in all these markets, uh, fine art, bitcoins, uh, pretty much everything that's nailed down in the paper world that's exposed to the Fed's balance sheet, because as we know, there's a ninety percent correlation between the Fed's balance sheet and uh, and stocks. Yeah. I mean, are we talking about that there's some new paradigm here that justifies valuations way above historical averages, or is this simply money printing, and will it end with? Real losses or nominal losses or both? Well, I can't answer the nominal uh, equation because, I mean, the the bankers make money on the ups and the downs. Um, I, I think that they can't afford to do another down. Um, and that's why, I, you know, I hear these guys who are, you know, geniuses and shorting, uh, you know, tech stocks in the end of 2000. And, and now they're saying that the valuations are so out of reality, it's now time to short um, you know, stocks at these levels because they, you know, we can't justify it. And I would throw caution to them saying it would be just as dangerous to short the stocks as it would to be, you know, long these stocks. It's, uh, you're involved in, you know, how do you value these things? It's like choosing, uh, trying to figure out where you are inside of an illusion, inside of an enigma. I mean, it's like riddle upon riddle upon riddle. Like there is no reality anymore. Um, and it's all based off the whims of what they choose to, to purchase because they're creating money out of thin air. It doesn't cost them anything, but they can move markets, trillions of dollars of markets and cash flow all over the place. Well, absolutely. It's, it's the ex perfect example of other people's money. I mean, I wrote a piece called Hedge Bombs a year or two ago showing how for years they've underperformed the market. They're not geniuses. They just happen to be paid to own stocks in a market where the Fed is printing money and the PPT is supporting it every day. It's a great business to be in. I was in, I was in hedge fund for years. We always underperform the market. It doesn't matter. As long as things are going up, you still get paid your fee. Mm -hmm. And uh, as for you know what I, why I asked real versus nominal and you, had, and you answered exactly how, how I would answer, I mean, look at the Caracas Exchange in Venezuela as the poster child. They have 50% inflation this year. Their government needs to lease out their gold to Goldman Sachs to pay their bills. And the Caracas Exchange is up 500% this year. I mean, they have toilet paper shortages there. So, you know, I, in, in Weimar, Germany, Zimbabwe, and most of the other 27 hyperinflations of the 20th century, stocks went up nominally. But eventually, yeah. they got crushed in real terms, uh, certainly against the cost of living and, of course, against precious metals once they uh, lost control of the powers that be. So, and, and see, yeah. that's that's mm -hmm. the riddle there. Like, you know, so what if the, the stock market goes to 20,000 or Bitcoin goes to a million? Those things are only worth what you can exchange them for in real wealth. Like, you know, you could have stocks that go up all the way. But you know what? If you can't afford to buy a house uh, with all the gains that are in there or, or food or, or uh, water or gold or whatever, you have to value everything in ratios. Stop looking at it in dollar terms. That's the number one thing I think blinds investors is that they're chasing dollar returns. What they should be doing is looking for assets that are either relatively overvalued or undervalued next to other real assets. And, you know, using the Dow to gold ratio, um, you know, how, how do you not own gold versus the Dow right now? I mean, the, 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 it, over the past year, uh, the Dow's radically outperformed gold. Well, geez, why wouldn't you own a real asset and get back into gold at that point? You look at the gold to silver ratio. Um, it's very overvalued towards gold. Why wouldn't you get into silver at that point? Um, so I, I don't care about all these dollar valuations of Bitcoin and art and all, you know, all these other things. Value it relative to oil. Value it relative to uh, gold or silver, to, to uh, a commodity like corn or something like that. 
value to the real tangible things. And that'll tell you if you're really getting ahead or if you're just fooling yourself chasing after paper assets. Yeah, that's right. I mean, uh, I wrote a piece called uh, Dollar Price Gold years ago uh, because people are so focused on that $1,900 gold, not realizing that gold is priced in 150 other currencies. So, I mean, earlier this year, we saw record levels of Japanese yen gold, rupee gold. In fact, the Japanese yen gold is only 10% below its all-time high. And, uh, you know, I, I just wrote what piece called if a nuclear bomb destroyed Europe. Of course, the euro would go away, but would that be good for the dollar? Of course not. It would, it would be cataclysmic for the dollar. So, again, it's really a matter of, of what, what your dollar can buy in terms of real items of value and what it's going to be able to buy in the, in the future, which is why... Getting, getting ounces of physical gold and silver at these prices uh, is, is of immeasurable value. And that brings me to my last question I have for you, since you're a major silver advocate, as I am, but I'm a little more even uh, keeled, mm -hmm. gold versus silver. Why are you more focused on silver? Uh, do you believe it's a superior asset uh, or it has better monetary utility or simply it's just more undervalued? Yeah, I mean, Andy, when I first looked, I mean, I, I got out of the housing bubble and that, I knew that was the first thing I needed to do. I, and then I saw, OK, well, I have all this money sitting in a, in a, you know, a computer screen and I felt uncomfortable even with that money sitting on the computer screen. And, and, I, and I started to realize that, you know, all that all that is, is a future claim on wealth. Real wealth is real things that you can touch and use and, and, and feel. Um, so I, I ran across Jim Rogers book called uh, hot commodities back in 2005 and I read through that and I go okay this this makes sense and, and I realized that most commodities are you know have storage or degradation issues so it's not very easy to get involved in the oil market or the cattle market or anything along those lines which brought me to precious metals and Jim only talked about gold there and uh, so I go okay I get gold and I, I started buying gold I mean those are the first things that I bought I bought you know a couple hundred ounces of gold back at the time. Um, and it wasn't until I became more aware of the silver story that I was like, God, how, why isn't anybody talking about this? And I realized a lot of these, you know, gold guys specifically didn't mention silver. And I, I looked at, you know, the gold to silver ratio. I mean, you look at any mining, uh, you know, uh, uh, production of the, of the world, you know, for every one ounce of gold, there's nine ounces of silver. So if silver is nine times more abundant than gold, why is it being priced as, as if it's 60 times more abundant? Um, and I started to look through that. And then, geez, I started to look at the 10,000 uses um, that, are, that are being used and that all, a lot of the most profitable uses um, are going to fund the next generation of, of energy and technology and defense and medical uh, applications. They're talking about silver curing cancer and you know, all these things and, and then throw in the, uh, the, the stockpile depletion that we've been using and abusing silver as this cheap, uh, you know, industrial uh, metal for so long that we've destroyed the stockpiles of it. So then I'm like, God, if in reality, there's only one to nine gold to silver ratio, if we've been mining it, and it used to be like, you know, one to 12, one to 15, when uh, silver was a little bit more abundant during, you know, during the older times. And now that we've, uh, um, uh, uh, brought that down. Um, but then I'm, I'm saying, well, I, I know empirically that gold has never been like thrown away. I mean, they, they treasure gold. I mean, they, they, when you think of treasure, you think of gold, but silver has been thrown away in, you know, uh, you know, electronic computers and, and all this stuff and used in such small quantities that for all intents and purposes, it's gone. Um, and I looked at the stockpiles that have been uh, you know, destroyed. The United States in 1950 had 5 billion ounces of silver in, in a strategic stockpile. Now it has none because it, over the last 60 years it's been selling into the market. Now it has none. Um, so I'm of the opinion that I, I, I know I can't be in any paper asset. There's too much counterparty risk. There's too much, uh, you know, problems with, uh, you know, if there's a currency collapse, like there's, Every social, political, and financial contract will be broken as soon as those currencies are destroyed. So I know I can't be in any paper assets. And then commodities, I couldn't be in, you know, majority of them because of the storage and degradation issues. Um, and then gold to silver. I mean, those are the choices for me. And I started looking at all the benefits of silver. I'm like, God, you know, how, how, how do you not get in there? And then, you know, <laughs> you, you know, you get as much into it as, as I do. Then you start looking at the beautiful coins and all that other stuff. So... Um, I am 100% invested in physical silver. I have been 100% for now two and a half years, but uh, you know I really put in a lot in 2005, and 
you know, God, I'm coming up on eight years of being in this trade. And, and I know that it's not going to end until the dollar ends. I mean, there's no other way out of this. And it's not really as much of a bet on silver as much as a bet against everything else. Well, I couldn't have said it any better myself. And I, too, agree on the valuation standpoint. I, I For all the reasons you stated, I believe that the gold-silver ratio must fall uh, below 15 to 1. It could fall to 5 to 1 for all we know. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I am 100% invested myself, but I'm half and half simply because that's how I feel comfortable. Uh, but everyone needs to feel their own comfort level and, uh, for God's sakes, do something about it yeah. uh, before the ounces aren't there to buy. Uh, so uh, lastly, Chris, please just give us a little background on your website and how people can get in touch with you. Yeah, I mean, I, I got a couple things. Uh, the prime, probably most well known for my YouTube channel is called "The Greatest Truth Never Told." We've been at it for two years. We got 10 million views and 50,000 subscribers. Um, it, it's been a real blast to do that. Um, I also have uh, my silver bullet, silver shield uh, coins that we were, we were, you know, on I think on our 12th design in, in less than a year or just over a year. Um, and, you know, I'm really trying to put messages on to silver that I think will be historically significant. Um, and, you know, the, the wonderful thing, Andy, about these coins, you and I, you know, do videos and articles and interviews and stuff like that. And they, they have a shelf life of a couple days, let's be honest. I mean, maybe if you get a couple of videos or articles that are really, uh, you know, resonate with people, you might get a little bit longer out of that. But when I started designing these coins, I realized that regardless what happens, these designs are going to be around hundreds of years from now, maybe, you know, maybe collectibles and stuff like that. And I think that the message of, uh, you know, that people will look back at this time period and, and see the historical insanity of a world gone insane on, on fiat money and uh, spreading war and, and debts all over the place and, and, you know, generational debts that we've uh, laid upon our kids. And then the, and then this, I'm sure going to be climactic, uh, collapse and and uh, the change of, of people's consciousness. I, I think it's going to be uh, you know historically significant to have um, you know the ability for people to look back and see coins that have messages like you know against the debt and death paradigm and slave queen and all those other things where um, people are going to realize well not everybody was insane you know back then you know and and yeah. uh, hopefully they'll run across my work and your work and. And hopefully provide a better foundation for a better society. And I think that's ultimately what's going to happen uh, after everything's going to collapse. I think that we're going to be far, far better off. Um, and I look forward to seeing how my kids are going to live significantly better um, than the era that I've been brought up in. Well, fortunately, those coins and our videos will be immortalized so people can realize exactly what you said, that there was some sanity in this time of insanity. Well, anyway, that's it for the week. Chris, thanks so much for being on the show, and I look forward to speaking again soon. Excellent, Andy. I, I'm Again, thank you for having me on. This was a real pleasure. You, you're a very uh, cogent interviewer, and I, I, I just appreciate uh, the opportunity to speak with you.